Welcome to The Tippy Top, the podcast that helps entrepreneurs succeed by sharing best practice and creating alignment with investors. You'll hear from seasoned entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and industry professionals. The Tippy Top helps you learn vicariously because you simply don't have the time to learn every lesson through the School of Hard Knocks. A big welcome to David Dixon, our first digital business growth coach and non-exec director on the show. Now, you'll come to know David as a true tech visionary and one of the nicest people you'll actually meet. Thank you very much for that. It's, um, I've never had that said to me before, so it's, uh, it's quite nice to hear that, albeit a little bit embarrassing. It's all true, so easy to say. Now... David and I met in a circa 2019, uh, serving on boards of early, te- early stage tech businesses. We've seen a lot together, um, and that's given us a really strong appreciation of what it really takes to succeed in a startup. And uh, David, first up, do you want to tell us a bit about your uh, impressive background and briefly cover what your superpowers are? Yeah, no problem. Um, I mean, it, what I would say is I've, I've had an amazing career to this point, which has been full of amazing experiences. And, and what I've learned, I genuinely believe, is is unique. And, and I use it to add value every day in, in every business that I help and work with. Uh, but going back, I've had a, a wonderful opportunity of coaching, advising and consulting and getting my hands dirty with some amazing tech and digital businesses and also non-tech too. Um, I think it's important to get the point across that I'm multi-sector in terms of experience and expertise. Um, but going into the tech sector itself, I've, I've worked in the sector for about 20 years. I've pretty much been involved in it for 25. Um, I helped to build the original tech ecosystem in, in the Middlesbrough area and the wider Tees Valley, um, or Teesside, which depends which day of the week it is, uh, what we call it. Um, and, and ultimately, the ecosystem has spawned some amazing businesses that I've had the honour of helping and, and, and pushing on, and companies like Animersion, um, Transfer Go that are now based in London have just raised 60 million on a CVC round. Graphically, um, which is a company that was the first non-American company to get into the Tech Starts program and, and ultimately changed American law when it came to working visas and, and oh, I suppose started the, the whole Tech Stars international expansion. Uh, and a company called Double Eleven, one of the biggest game studios in, in the UK, possibly even the world, to be honest. And and all these companies, all these people, all these leaders are, are amazing people I've had the chance of really working very closely to. And, and it's been an amazing experience at this point. Um, I guess in the current, what I'm doing right now is I work at an organization called Digital City. Um, we do two things, uh, digital transformation um, in its wider sense across wider sectors. So that could be everything from talking visionary um, and, and looking at long term where technology is going to go right the way through to the here and now and, and adding a little bit of code onto a website um, and then there's also the digital growth side of things so i have created some amazing programs that have had uh, some insane if i'm being honest um, results um, i've been part of a few unsuccessful startups so taxi app way back in 2010 which i still think the idea that we had would work now but it felt the pieces a little bit I've been involved in the blockchain prop tech where we raised through an ICO. So I was, in, uh, I was an important part of that process through to daft things like trying to import core exports for the sale signs and import and then export of olive oil from um, a friend's um, plot of land that's in Spain. Non-exec on Booking Live, uh, which I'm sure we'll cover later on. And I've worked in the commercial training sector for five years too, which involved international, national and, and local businesses. Um, that's allowed me to create a brand new service for the corporate market, which is still being sold today, um, which I still can't get my head around that I've got something that has got my hands on it that was built by me that's actually selling commercially. Built some amazing international relationships in the Middle East, North Africa and, and the US. I've created programs that have changed lives and I've got amazing credibility and authority in my space. And it's, it's a real honor to do what I do and met and regularly converse with people that head up um, or used to head up brilliant um, divisions within huge organizations. So the um, Director of Creativity and Innovation at Coke and Disney, um, and the big stuff as well, not, uh, not franchise. And um, 
I suppose going back a little bit, uh, I created my first website in 1995, um, which was my dad's business, um, albeit I'm no coder now. And uh, the superpowers, God, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I guess when I look at what, I'm, what I think I'm great at, relationship development, um, strategy and vision, I can put those things together. I love connecting dots together. I see a big picture and I can work out how people can solve problems and how to get the right people at the right time. Um, as I've already mentioned, problem solving and, and coaching. Coaching is one of the best things that you can ever do um, because ultimately I've helped shape lives and businesses across so many sectors, so many ge geographical areas over 20 year periods. And I can honestly say it's been a brilliant ride and a brilliant opportunity and uh, I've loved every minute of it. Amazing. Amazing. And, and what, what I love is you know, a lot of people have got into tech in the last five, 10 years since it was in vogue. However, you've been there at the formative years and been you know, part of shaping that future. So it's, it's really good having that experience on the show and just so much to go for there in terms of your startup experience, as you say, the coaching, uh, all the leadership experience and uh, you know, working with those international brands. I mean, that's quite something. Now, <clears throat> we've... Um, try to distill that down into some core topics for the listeners as usual. And number one, we're going to look at how leadership is core to scaling. Number two, why some ideas fail and some succeed. And then uh, this uh, playing on your superpower futurism. I think this is a real treat for the listeners. So winding back to, well, I said 2000, but call it 1995 and then forward to 2050. And, and what will uh, the world of startups and tech look like and the world? So let's look at uh, part one, leadership is core to scaling. Now, you and I have had a, a brief discussion on this earlier, David, but some people think that tech businesses or about tech, what are they really about? Oh, uh, for me, it's about finding a gap um, which you can commercially exploit, and, and a lot of people forget that. I think um, people get caught in the trap, particularly university and, and university life. It kind of encourages people to think about tech first rather than business and commerciality and and how you grow. Um, and and a lot of people also forget that tech is merely an enabler. And people get so immersed in the technology to get that actually what problem are we solving? What what difference is this going to make? And, and is the world needing this? Or And even if it isn't the world needing it, is there enough of a niche um, for your product or your service? And that comes down to, for me, I'm a great believer in something called design thinking and, and ideation. And the world is beginning to wake up to this type of activity and, and, and do it more and more. But it's still not, I don't think, part of, certainly part of the, the psyche of the businesses I support. It's just not there as core. Um, and it's something that, for me, is a great way of, great leadership for me is, is about involving everybody, but at the right time and in the right way. Um, and when, when you're looking to create value, and that's what, for me, it's, it's all about, and value means different things to different people, but for me, jobs, um, economic wealth, fun, passion. Um, going through that process and everybody being involved is such a huge part of of success and and actually great leadership too um for businesses to be successful i think leadership and culture is huge and usually you only get one chance of setting a culture particularly in a rapidly growing business then people aren't necessarily um educated or aware of the power of culture and to an extent, I think, was it Drucker who came up with culture eat strategy for breakfast? And I remember learning about that at uni. And it's one of those nebulous things that you think, mm, well, is it really? Um, but it's only when you get in and, and deep and, and, and down with, with businesses that you realize actually culture is everything. And where does culture come from? Well, it's leadership. Um, and what is leadership? It's setting the right tone. It's understanding what, you, what you're looking to do and when you're going to do it by. And, and understanding that if, if you're going to be anything other than a consultant, you've somehow got to transfer knowledge, you've somehow got to transfer enthusiasm in a way which people buy into. And that when your back is turned, when you're not there leading the business, the leadership that you've given naturally carries on. So people act in the right way, they make decisions in the right way. Um, and I think particularly now people are working at, at, from home in the main, it adds another dimension to it as well. And and creating a culture in an organization whereby for 90% of the working week, you might not see each other. Hugely difficult. 
So for me, it is absolutely core to scaling a business 100%. Um, but it's about surrounding yourself with the right people, the right guidance in the first place. And, and sticking on that point of the, the board, um, I've, you know, I've often heard that the, the board sets the culture and then it cascades down. And that's part of that initial uh, step of leadership. Is that your experience? Not always, because if I put, my, if I put myself in, I've helped startups, I've helped pre-starts, and I've obviously helped scaling companies too. Um, but quite often, young business owners, don't necessarily have to be young people, but um, certainly inexperienced business owners, they don't know what they don't know. So they focus on um, what we mentioned earlier on in terms of the technology rather than the business. Um, and because most businesses that are startups or pre-starts, they don't necessarily have a board to work with unless they've gone down the route of um, raising cash. Um, it's it's quite often missed. So it, it's one of those things that we we as an as a country need to get better at nurturing businesses and, and impressing the importance of having mentors, having coaches, having non-exec directors. And I realize payments and, and, and how you get people engaged is, is difficult because nobody works for free or wants to work for free. Um, but there's got to be something out there from a government perspective because there's too many businesses fail very early on. And I don't think they fail in, in, the, in the main, I don't think they fail because there isn't a market or their solution isn't right for the market. I think they fail because of poor leadership. And, and what is leadership? Well, for me, it's about decision-making. Mm -hmm. And naturally, if you're inexperienced, you're gonna make poorer decisions um, because you haven't gone through the experience. So surround yourself with people that have been there and done it, for me, is, is absolutely key. So you're right, absolutely bang on in terms of we need more boards to help companies and leadership set culture but we're not always in that position to have those boards in place and actually one of the questions i wanted to ask you is is it and it seems like you've already answered it but it seems like we might have a, a leadership crisis in the uk relative to the us where it's done a lot better and i think there's a far more inspiration and uh, as you say leadership just to help entrepreneurs on that difficult journey does that resonate with you yeah, um, about two years ago, uh, I was lucky enough to go on um, a coaching trip, for want of a better phrase, I can't think of a better way of describing it, so I'll leave it there, um, over to uh, to Boston and, and Babson College. And, and Babson is, is labelled, um, I think, it, I don't think it's a self-title, I think they've actually um, outright won this um, accolade as being the leading entrepreneurial um, university college environment in, in the US, if not the world. And when we went over there, we were taught by some of the best people that have been at Harvard, um, been at MIT, um, and also Babson itself. And they've worked with some of the biggest and the best tech companies. So we had people from IDEO coming in there. We had people that um, had helped a lot of um, the big tech companies, Facebooks. Um, and they don't lack in confidence. They don't fear failure. They see failure as something which is a rite of passage. It's, it's a route to success. Therefore, it's by definition, it's not failure. It's education. And that mindset is a great mindset. And we, I think we have a fear of failure, which is greater than the potential of success um, in, in our psyche, in our culture, that maybe the Americans don't have. And I can't really speak for for anybody else across the world. And I can only speak for a little bit of the US system because I've only seen a little bit of it over a short period of time. But it's night and day in terms of, the, the, you know, the puff the chests out, the proud. And, and if, if, if failure comes along, it's embraced. And they speak with such a passion about how they've learned from it. And the tech ecosystem, including the, um, the investment um, side of things, almost embrace that and, and want that to have happened. Um, so for me, it's there's an absolute tangible difference culturally, and, and I do think that feeds into leadership and leadership in the UK. Um, I think we have got. I do think we have got great leaders. I do think we have got people that are very capable. But what we don't have is people that are confident first and foremost, and secondly, trained, nurtured, mentored, coached, whatever you want to frame it as. We don't have enough of that in place to really sort of eke out the natural talent. And most people in the UK that I come across lack belief and confidence, but they do know the answer. Mm. Very profound. 
for being really crystal clear for the entrepreneurs out there, how does like leadership, good leadership feed into growth? And can you have like growth and scale without good leadership? The simple answer to that question, I think, is no. Um, we need strong leadership. And, and that doesn't mean to say we need alpha male or alpha female. It, it, we, what we need is people that um, they've got a vision. They're working to the vision. They've got that North Star. They're very comfortable with that North Star, but they're also comfortable with that North Star changing as well. So people being in a comfort zone um, is, is very easy to get into. And that's something that is definitely a British psyche. Um, and, and great leaders, you need them because everybody's looking at, within an organization, everybody's looking for a little bit of certainty, something to hang their hat on. And, and if you don't have that, if you've got missing leadership or you've got leaders that you don't believe in, then how on earth are you going to um, put your your life in their hands, basically? Why on earth would you do that when there's other jobs out there, particularly yeah. if it's not your business, if you're just an employee of a business? Yeah. Um, so if you don't have that firm belief that they know what they're doing and they're comfortable in, in knowing what they're doing, then it's very difficult to achieve success because everybody's going to kind of exist rather than um, fighting for the same goal. And yes, we need to celebrate differences and we need to, to have a, a team that's got varied skill sets and experiences. But there's a danger that silos build up. And, and when silos build up culturally, it's extremely difficult to get out of the silo mentality. People naturally then build walls around themselves to protect themselves. So without that leadership, without that strength of, of knowing where you are, but also the, the humbleness to say that I might be wrong and therefore I'm open to challenge. Yes, you need the certainty that we believe in what you're doing and where you're going, but we also need to know that we can knock on your door. And when we knock on your door, that you are going to be open to, okay, what about this? Can we change this? So it's that strength of, of, of giving that impression that we know where we're going. But at the same time, being a little bit open to change and say, do you know what, if something isn't working, um, then we're prepared to change and pivot. So it's that balance between the two of, and it almost seems like a dichotomy really of, of, of being open to challenge, but at the same time showing strength, we know where we're going, mm -hmm. but we need to have that balance right and, and mm -hmm. people need to believe yeah, no, absolutely. That's crystal clear. And the analogy I, I use, and a lot of the listeners will know, it, that spring steel where you can bend, but there's some core strength there. Um, and, and that's far better than you know steel that's that doesn't move because then it risks cracking completely. So, um, yeah, absolutely great. And, and leading on from that, and you've obviously covered one mechanism, but part two, why some ideas fail and some succeed. Now, You've uh, alluded to many businesses you've worked on and with uh, and even started yourself. And, um, and you've also worked on a number of noteworthy ideas that perhaps haven't come to fruition yet. Um, what are some of the factors that have led to success or failure within those organizations? I think when it comes to um, success versus failure, there is going to be an element of luck. I think sometimes being at the right place at the right time, um, you, you still need to have something in you. You still need to have um, a character. You still need to spot the opportunity. Um, but most people, so I, I run a scale program uh, and, and that program was, was designed from the ground up. And yes, it was inspired by a number of books that I read. Um, one being the Vern Harnish Scaling Up book. Um, but that that focuses on leadership. And we've, I know we've already discussed that, but the mainstay of, 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 of what we focus on is leadership and, and, and evangelizing and, and getting people on the same page and understanding where we're going and, and things like meeting rhythms, um, understanding that the board is actually connected to the cleaner. And I realize that's a really poor and bad analogy, but everybody should feel like they know where they are and they know where they belong and what their, what their role is um, in whatever success looks like. And I think failure tends to happen when businesses grow from that four, five, six um, employee stage, which usually is sort of early founders, mm -hmm. um, into sort of management and leadership and, and where you've got no longer got full control all day, every day. Mm -hmm. 
and and businesses and business owners and leaders find it difficult in my view with the experience that i've had transitioning from having total control into having limited control because other people are now beginning to make decisions on your behalf and i think that comes again back to confidence and belief and um, and are you truly in that zone where you you know where you're going you've transferred that enthusiasm across you've got a team that feel like they're on the same bus and not feel but also know um, that they're on the same bus and then from that are able to transfer that on to other people as well and that transition and that trust that has to come with that it's very very rarely there because people never really want to let go and when they don't let go i think that's when the recipe for disaster happens in terms of failure Mm -hmm. Um, because you can't if you're going to achieve something big in life you cannot do it alone you can't it's just impossible you need at the very least you need four or five people on the journey with you um but most often it's 5 10 15 20 30 and more people mm-hmm. and um letting go but having the confidence to let go is 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 crucial yeah absolutely i love that it, it, it's not a lot easier said than done particularly when it's absolutely. your business <laughs> absolutely yeah i've witnessed it so many times where People are genuinely in love with what they do. They get into work every day and it's not work for them. Um, and they've convinced the, the first two or three people to get involved with them. They're all usually sat in the same room. They're all usually talking every day. There's, there's a phone call comes in or an email comes in. They can shout across at each other. But the moment you go into another room or the moment you go into a bigger building, those conversations tend to stop. And if you haven't got the basics right, which goes back to the leadership, which goes back to the coaching and the mentoring and making sure that you've got a board around you that can help you on these and, and, and spot these bumps in the road, that's when trouble for me really, really happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And can you perhaps talk about the importance of focusing on your customers' needs and your customers and keeping them at the core of your business? Yes, um, for me, there's got to be a space for, a space for visionaries too. Um, and sometimes customers don't know what they need. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a band, and it's a relatively small band of people that recognise before the customers do that this is going to come along and actually this is what you need. But I think for the, rump, for the vast majority of people, um, you've got to focus on need because if you don't focus on need, how do you identify a gap? And if you can't identify a gap, and it isn't strong enough in terms of the unique selling point or the competitive advantage, whatever you want to frame it as. If that's mm-hmm. not strong enough, you're then going to be caught in a battle, which is basically a race to the bottom in terms of price, because that's the de facto point that people will go back to. Um, and if you don't get that value right at the very beginning, or you certainly don't get it sorted quite early on within the business's lifetime, I've seen it so often where people revert naturally back to well i'll cut my prices to win the work but they then forget about well have you got a margin built in to cut that price and if the margin isn't right if you haven't got a handle on the margin how on earth are you going to survive 12 18 24 months down the track and that's when people bury their head in the sands and it comes back to leadership it comes back to surround yourself with the right people that will ask those challenging questions to say are you in business to go in a race to the bottom or are you in business to make a difference, mm. to add value and extract decent value in terms of monetary value in, in turn from that? Mm. Um, and, and people quite often forget to start off with that, but they quite often forget when they get 6, 12, 18 months into a business, they quite often forget that it is about that value and, and making sure that you create the economic wealth on the back of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I see that a lot. People say, we're better and we're cheaper. I say, well, hang on a minute, if you're better, you should be charging more. And if you're not, then I don't believe you. Again, going back to the scale program, we focus so much time and effort on value. What is your value? Where is your value in the future? Uh, And we get people working. um, So the premise of the scale program is it's very much peer to peer because I want leaders to help leaders. Um, And what we do is we, we, we tease out a question or we tease out a conundrum or we tease, we spot an opportunity and we'll say to, there might be 10 to 15 people in a room, and, and we'll get people around a piece of paper on the wall, we'll get some post-it notes out, and we'll help solve a conundrum. And usually that conundrum is around value. Do you really want to be known for being the cheapest, or do you want to be known for delivering excellence? 
mm. and and what will people be willing to pay for excellence and then comes back to who is your market because not everybody's your market and not everybody needs to be a market but which niche and it could be a huge niche but which niche is going to pay good money for this what problem are you solving for that niche and how are we then going to communicate it and people then forget about the communication side of things mm, absolutely i mean a silly example but uh, coffee you know coffee used to be just this kind of dishwater that you got somewhere and someone came up with a bright idea hang on we can charge a lot of money and the way we do that is through value through doing you know fancy coffees which are now commonplace flat whites espressos and all of a sudden people are charging four or five times the, the commonly accepted price and that's just down to value um so yeah interesting going on that journey and speaking of transitions um uh, david you've been privy to tech development since 1995 2000 and so the scale of change must be absolutely uh, amazing i mean you know things that you know in the last two years we've seen nfts come along i mean maybe they were in, in existence before but not popular how is that all feeding into your vision for the future and can you actually pontificate what that might actually look like i think from, I want to go big here. If you look back at the human race over the last 150 years, pretty much the industrial revolution, the leaps forward that we've made as a species is, is insane. Um, and it's between sort of the 1850s right the way through to, um, I suppose, the digital revolution in, in the 90s, we, we had flight, we had television, we had the telephone, we had electricity. All these things came along and fundamentally changed, um, albeit looking looking back now it, it, it kind of seems constantly up but living it it would have felt like a long time between some of these um, advances coming along and when you look at the, the the near past so between the 95 up to say 2020 we, we've seen the rise of social media we've seen the rise of mobile phones of, of connectivity um and it, it's given us insane opportunity we've literally got the internet in our hands we've got therefore all of humans um, or the human knowledge base is in our hands to ask at any point so therefore the answers are all there I think we haven't got quite got the um, the method of, of how we can get the answers the more the quickest and the most efficient way I think that still needs to be solved um, but when you look at from Facebook and YouTube um, and interestingly Digital City who I work for now we were birthed in in year 2000 to pretty much the year i started in the tech industry albeit i wasn't employed by digital city at that point and, and our university was really visionary at that point they, they saw the opportunity in front of them and we created a vr center on campus and it was probably one of the first if not the first globally and when you think we've had vr for 15 to 20 years and it's taken a while let's be honest we're still not there yet in terms of something that everybody uses every day um but that said when you look at the connectivity we now have and we look at the mobile phones we look at the computers that we now have everything has just come along in 20 25 years and you think it, it's difficult to appreciate how much our lives have changed almost pre-digital native to, to where we are now and that 25 year period i genuinely think the next 10 years we're probably going to have the same advances forward that what we have done in the 25 so i guess the point i'm trying to make is ten, the last the next 10 years is going to be like the last 25 years those 25 years is almost like the previous 125 years before it and the advancement is is happening so quick i do worry that we as, as a race and it's going to sound really profound and and and, and worries from now um, but i do worry that we as a race may well come unstuck with with how quick things move forward and whether we're capable of of managing and controlling it because i i look at the future and it does worry me in terms of where we're going not just climate change i think mm. um digital is the is at least an equal threat to climate change to humanity as, uh, mm. as as i mentioned the climate change agenda yeah particularly with our, our our caveman and cavewoman brains who aren't used to that level of dopamine and all those problems that we're seeing uh, happen now and addictions and all sorts and um i mean that, that's extremely interesting and if, if i could press you on this mm. what do you think the future of tech startups is actually going to look like I think it's still in our lifetime. I mean, I'm no prophet. I'm, I'm no Elon Musk, but I think in our lifetimes, it's still going to be humans in the main because I don't think any computer is going to replace creativity and innovation. 
Um, I do think an awful lot of jobs are going to be automated, but actually as human beings, I think we're built to be creative and, Im and imaginative rather than just fully automated all of the time, albeit there is absolutely a place for, for those type of roles. But I do think nature and uh, the nature of technology will mean that a lot of those roles will change. And we need to have um, more people more focused on using our creative brains. And if we do that, I think it's still going to be reliant on humans. We're still going to have um, a lot of people involved in business, but I just think we're going to operate in a very different way. Yeah, a absolutely. And I actually did a webinar the other day saying, rise over the machines, should you be scared? Well, perhaps if you're doing something that's manual and, and you know repeatable and can be done by a machine, but don't do that. Don't try to compete head to head with computers. Do things that make you human. You know, leverage your skill sets. The information's there. So if you wrote, learn something, that's not a valuable skill for humanity. And it is that creativity and that innovation. So I fully echo that. There's something, there's something called singularity. Mm. Um, and singularity is a point where basically the computer brain is as advanced, if not more advanced than the human brain. Um, and I don't personally, I don't think it's going to happen in the next 40 or 50 years. It's going to happen. And, and when that does happen, it's a big fundamental question for us as human beings, because what is our role then? If we get into a point where machines can think like us, feel like us at that point, that for me is extremely worrying. But that said, I do think we're a hell of a long way, probably outside of our lifetimes away from that. <laughs> That's the only comfort I can take about that statement. So sticking on that theme of, of startups and what the future might look like, how do entrepreneurs adequately prepare themselves for this future? With entrepreneurs, I think they've got to be more fleet of foot. That in every day becomes a business startup. Um, so you've got to have that mentality that something might come in and change the, the adaptability we've never needed as much as what we need now historically we've 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 been able to build businesses and models with an element of certainty that five years down a track things won't change a huge amount yes there'll be slow and small iterative changes but fundamentals will remain the same whereas you're building a business now you've almost got to believe that whatever you've built in terms of an idea whatever you've built in terms of a business model you've got to believe that that might change tomorrow and whilst we've had pandemics historically in, in our lives, I don't think we've, we've been in the situation we've had most recently where we've had to flip businesses completely because we've never shut societies down before. It's just never happened. Um, and yet we have, and we've survived first and foremost as a race, we've survived. And yes, there's, there's an awful lot of death around and, and horrific times for, for a great many people, but as a race, we will survive COVID. Um, and what we've shown is that when we've needed to adapt, we've absolutely moved heaven and earth and we've done it. And in the main, government and businesses have worked in harmony to make sure that we've, we've got businesses that are sustainable where possible. Um, and, and having that open mind that every day another pandemic could come along and therefore a, a country could shut down for weeks and months on end. You've almost got to live with that every day. Never before have you had to business plan these types of things. But I dare say now pretty much every business will be seeing in, in their business planning process. What happens if we have to close the economy down? How do we go to remote working? How do we still serve a client when we're outdoor focused for argument's sake or hospitality mm -hmm. focused? And, and for me, business leaders now, it isn't just providing that North Star and the certainty and security. It's, it's, all, it's also being able to horizon scan in what is a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, um, something that is that's changing all the time. How do we provide that um, certainty that we trust you and we trust your decision making? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, be every day thinking something might come along and absolutely undermine what I've said to my team yesterday or said to customers yesterday. Mm -hmm. So that for me is, is something we all need to get used to, whether we're employees or whether we're owners of businesses we all have to be so much more adaptable mm. and and the way technology is now and the way we're moving the fast pace of it we have to be that way and climate change i think the difference between the climate change and the pandemic is the climate change isn't visible now 
it's mm. visible potentially 20 30 40 50 years so therefore it's not right in people's faces whereas the pandemic was mm. and it's almost we need that we need that mentality we need that understanding for climate change as we did with the pandemic um because as well as technology is going to change everything let's be honest climate change could change everything for everybody again yeah. and having to adapt to a very unstable planet and, and i don't say that lightly i think is, is going to be huge mm. wow i mean that's been extremely insightful and um yeah so you know we've got that relevant example of the pandemic and, and climate change that keeps coming up on the show and um you know yeah, yeah, it doesn't hit you in the face now, but you, you just have to look at a couple of the movies that have come out and you're like, oh, that could be a reality. So um, hopefully people take notice of it sooner rather than later. Now, I'm going to summarize our, our three main topics of the day. And then um, if you could just tell us uh, where we can find you online, and we're going to go into a quick fire Q&A. But first to that summary, leadership is core to scaling. So David said that you actually need to find a commercial gap. It's not about the tech. Uh, leadership, if we could distill it down, it's about making decisions, but maybe not yourself, that everyone has that autonomy, it, autonomy within their business unit to actually do it themselves, um, particularly when you're not there. And why is leadership important to scaling? Because people need a North Star. They need something to focus on and to believe in. And they've sacrificed some of their career to be with you. And there's got to be good reason. Number two, why some ideas fail and some succeed. There is an element of luck, although the harder you try, the probably luckier you will get. Um, I think hire people better than you and be ready to let go. Easier said than done. And then focus on your customers' needs, but also realize that they actually might not know how to innovate and they might not know what they want. So allow that futurism to come in. And sticking on that theme, uh, number three, futurism, winding back to 2004 to 2050, what will we see? Well, in the next 10 years, we'll probably see that, you know, the same innovation that we've seen over the past 25 years. If you want to stay relevant, treat every day like it's a startup. Be uh, you know, ready to uh, be nimble and um, malleable. And um, things will probably still be people-led. Machines aren't going to take over, so fear not. So, David, thanks again for that. Do you want to tell the listeners where they can find more of these pearls of wisdom online? Absolutely. Just before I do, just going back to that futurism thing, I just thought um, Zuckerberg did a, an hour stint a couple of weeks back now in terms of what he sees as the future and, and the metaverse future. And there's no doubt in my mind that will happen. We are going to go that way. We are going to be um, working and operating in in an environment that's similar to the Ready Player One um, film that came out. And anybody that hasn't seen that, please watch it, because for me, that is where we're going to go. The worrying thing for me is that one commercial entity is positioning itself as basically ruling the roost when it comes to metaverse. And if you think metaverse, it's ultimately an unlimited universe, which technically is what we all live in anyway. Um, but this is something that's going to be created by a single person and a single entity. And, and what happens if he passes on and the business that is Facebook or, or meta that it's called now, what happens if somebody else is, is in charge of that that doesn't have the right intentions? And I know there's a debate about whether Mark Zuckerberg does or not, but let's assume that he does. Let's assume that he wants the best for humanity. But what happens if he creates this, this thing, this metaverse that ultimately control, he, his business ultimately controls everything that goes on in it and therefore has a significant influence at the very least, if not total control on the real world at the same time. And another business owner comes along that, let's just say, doesn't have the right intention. That for me is such a worry and it's something we need to fight against. It's probably the strong term, but I think for me, it needs to be decentralized. It needs to be built around nobody owning the metaverse and everybody having the opportunity to build inside of it. Mm. Um, sorry, I just wanted to say that before uh, I went onto the handles. Um, so you can find me on Twitter at David Dixon one. You can find me on LinkedIn on David Dixon one. Um, and I think that's pretty much it where I, uh, yeah, where I push myself and where I work now is um, is Digital City. So if you want to have a, a look at what we do and, and some of the programs I run, we've got so much content and so many videos. So if you look on my LinkedIn profile, you see all the videos for the scale program and the effect it's had on people's lives. 
but on the website as well as some great um, show reels. Fantastic, great. Thanks, David. Now, on to quickfire Q&A. You studied business management and finance. If you did it again, would you choose the same? Do you know, that's a really, really tough question. Um, because when I first started out in life, I wanted to work in the space sector. So I did maths, physics and IT at, mm -hmm. uh, at college. That mm -hmm. was the plan. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I failed maths. And if you fail maths invariably, you're going to fail physics because it's one and the same. So the one I did succeed in was, was IT. So I kind of always had the feeling I was going to go into the IT space. But doing business, looking back now, I don't think the degree was hugely relevant to the to the job I do now and where I'm at now, but I do think it was a foundation and an important building block. So I wouldn't change anything. I would I would stick with business management because it covers so many broad areas and it's allowed me to cover so many broad areas as I've got older and as I've, I've got into the business advisory and coaching game. So mm -hmm. in an ideal world, um, I would have gone into the space sector, but I don't think, I genuinely don't think I was ever brainy enough to go down that route, but um, I've still got an interest in it, so I've not lost that. You keep that dream. Yeah, good answer. Now, best piece of advice for entrepreneurs? For me, it's simple. Surround yourself with great people. Um, I would also embrace doubt and, and risk at the same time, because actually it's all about doubt and risk. You know, you, you're always mitigating that, but you've got to believe. You've got to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to transfer that across to other people and you're not going to have impact. So surround yourself with the great people. Believe and, and make sure that you transfer that belief, but not in an alpha male ego-driven way, in a way which gets people on the bus, mm -hmm. in the right seats. You're driving it and people are thinking, do you know what? He or she is a brilliant leader. I would run through brick walls for this person. Well said. Startups. US or UK, where should we base ourselves? In an ideal world, uh, so I'm working on an idea now, I think it's more of a visionary idea and therefore US. And I think the US is more open to the visionaries and, and willing to back more of the visionary, whereas the UK, I think, is probably more safe in terms of its investments, albeit it is changing. Um, and the way technology is and, and London is, is ultimately the centre of the world, so I think the ecosystem in London is very different even from a Birmingham or Leeds or Manchester. But once you come into my area of the world, which is in the northeast of England, quite a quiet area in many ways, I just don't think that the investors in our area are in any way, shape or form as visionary or as willing to back, not so much a punt because that's derogatory, but take that chance on somebody. And, and so what's the benefits of being in the UK or in London as a startup? Um, in, in the UK, I think fintech is, is our thing, isn't it? And um, if you look at the percentage of investments that get made into business, you probably know better than me, Alex, but I think we're pushing 80, 90% of all investments going to London. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the investments that are going to London, 80, 90% of them go into fintech or affiliated. So there's, there's definitely a heavy skew towards that geographical area and that particular sector. Um, we need to spread that, if I'm being honest. We need to be, for me, we need to be starting to do different things and, and, and running accelerator programs. So the Techstars brand, the Y Combinator brand, I think they're brilliant brands and they will culturally, if we get more of them type of things in the UK, but outside of London, um, I think it will massively change the psychology and the psyche of, young people coming out of colleges or universities um, and, and setting up businesses because we need more people to set up businesses, but we need more educated people to set yeah. up businesses surrounded by the right people. Yeah, absolutely. And your favorite way to unwind? It's family. Um, it, it's everything to me, if I'm being honest. Um, I've got two children that are the absolute apples of my eye and I look at them and, and every day I, I just I fall in love with them because they're the, the perfect little human beings in terms of how I would want my, my children to grow in life, very polite, very courteous. And um, I love spending time with the pair of them. And, mm -hmm. and my boy in particular, he's just got into the whole games um, scenario. So as a kid, I played Xbox and... Mm -hmm. I had an MSX way back in the day in the early 80s, which not many people will have heard of. So I've been a gamer pretty much all my life, and now I've got a boy that's also a gamer as well. So playing Fortnite and watching him play football, watching him train, um, and just spending time with my daughter watching TV. Um, that's pretty much where we're at now. But um, 
spending time with my, with my wife too, going over to uh, Europe and seeing some fantastic cities. That for me mm. is, is the best way to unwind because when it comes down to it, it's all about family and friends. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well said. And best part of your job? Oh, I've got a number of different hats to wear. So are we thinking the non-exec or are we thinking my day job? I would say the day job, oh, the, the growth consultant, okay. that piece. Do you know what the, what I love? And it, you cannot, it, it's impossible to explain uh, the feeling I get of doing the job I, I do, but I get the real honour and privilege of helping hundreds, probably even thousands now of business owners achieve their life goals. And, and I get to add my value. I get to be involved in very serious, very precious, um, very private discussions in many ways, whether it's about the person themselves. Quite often, uh, I seem to be a person that does attract people to talk about the personal problems, which I've got absolutely no problem with. But it's a real honor to, to be let in and trusted. Mm. Um, and, and that is a real privilege, if I'm being honest, to, to have an effect, not just in one business, but I've had effect on hundreds of businesses. Mm. I'm genuinely so proud of myself. Um, and it sounds really arrogant saying that, but do you know what? I am proud of what I've done and what I've achieved and, and the people that I've helped. Um, and, and one of the biggest ones is Transfer Well, mentioned at the top of the show, 60 mm. million investment they've got now. And at the, in the early days, I helped them. Um, there's a, a company that's just sold for 70 million pounds called Court Sync. In the very early days at Startup, I helped them. And, mm. and I've had messages off the pair of them since saying, thank you because you played such an important role. That for me yeah. is, you, you cannot put a price on 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 that unless, if, yeah, you probably, I'm probably now frustrated thinking I should be doing this myself, but it is, it's a great honor, I love it. Mm. You should be proud. And uh, I would say that's definitely part of the definition of success. If you, if you can accomplish that, uh, phenomenal, really impressive. Anything else you want to share with the listeners? Uh, nothing other than what I've said. Um, there's so many opportunities out there. And, and I genuinely believe, as much as I've said, there's a threat on the horizon. I also think there's huge, massive, massive opportunities on the horizon too. And if, if we as humans get our heads together, there is no problem that we can't solve. The minds that are on this planet, and you don't have to be Elon Musk I've met so many people that are average people doing an average role, but they're super intelligent, super mm. smart. What we don't do is connect these dots together. Mm. There is so much opportunity and the power of, of civic engagement and getting people working together towards common aims is, is huge. So I just hope that a lot of the problems, the big problems that we've got on the horizon, we solve um, by coming together and, and using technology as an enabler to do that. Mm -hmm. And funny yeah. enough, that's pretty much what my idea is around that I'm thinking of. <laughs> love to hear more but we'll, we'll take that one offline look David thanks again uh, extremely insightful and I particularly enjoyed that, that piece around leadership and futurism so really thanks for your time and thanks for sharing all that valuable advice with the listeners not a problem and uh, if I've missed anything off invite me back on I'm sure we can have another discussion will do great thanks again that's all for this episode. Keep tuning in for more exclusive content on how to succeed as an entrepreneur. Make sure that you follow the Tippy Top on all social channels, including Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, or now Meta, Insta, YouTube, with at the Tippy Top blog. And check out my website, thetippytop.com. And you can also find me, Alexander Lee, on LinkedIn. Until next time, keep pushing, and I'll see you at the Tippy Top. Cheers.